Thank you, Chairwoman Johnson and Ranking Member Lucas, but really thank you to our uh, witness experts who are here today. We do appreciate your expertise. I'm fortunate because I'm from the Pacific Northwest where we still have glaciers in the Cascade Range and the beautiful Wallowa Mountains in Eastern Oregon. And over the years, the snow and ice masses have really helped delicately balance our uh, temperature, our, our water temperature and our ecosystems. Uh, the nutrient content, uh, glacial meltwater has provided drinking water and the runoff helps power our communities, tourism and outdoor recreation are really important in our state. People travel to see our streams, uh, rivers and lakes, which the glacial sediment makes this iconic teal color. It's a beautiful place. You should all come and visit. Um, but, but today, the glaciers that have once filled a lot of the hanging valleys and the moraines and the mountaintops across some of the most pristine regions are rapidly melting and in large part because of anthropogenic uh, emissions. On Mount Hood, which we can see from Portland uh, in my home state, the Sandy Glacier clay caves were once uh, the largest glacier cave system in the lower 48 states, but now the glacier is melting at an alarming rate. And further north uh, of Oregon at the uh, Columbia River Basin the gla at Glacier National Park, uh, they're losing the geologic features that provided its namesake. In fact, uh, when it was founded in 1910, the park had about 150 glaciers. And according to a study from Portland State University in the USGS, the park is on track to lose its remaining 26 glaciers in the next few decades. Dr. Moon, um, thank you for your testimony. You mentioned the role of glaciers in sustaining ecosystems. And in Northwest Oregon, the expedited rate of melting of glaciers could have have significant consequences for our salmon uh, and steelhead populations and threaten recreational and commercial fishing, tribes, species that benefit from healthy salmon runs. And as the glaciers melt and the water flows change and the water temperatures warm uh, in the Columbia Basin, the tributaries um, and, and tributaries, the fisheries are threatened. So how quickly are these larger ecosystem changes taking place and are there potential adaptation and mitigation strategies that we in Congress can support to help at this point in time? Um, I would say, and you might, find too some that you have many problems also related to those that are being seen in Alaska and mm -hmm. receive comments there. Um, certainly the we are losing uh, those glaciers very rapidly uh, just as you cited we're seeing uh, retreat and ice loss at rates that have never been seen in these areas and so those fundamental changes that are happening rapidly and quickly are changing the ecosystem just as quickly. One right. thing to consider is that in many of these places, we initially see a bump in the amount of water because we're getting warmer air temperatures. We still have the glaciers there at the moment. So you actually get a bump in water availability. And we see um, communities also in other places in the world where they depend even more strongly on glaciers for um, drinking or irrigation water or adjusting to an added level of um, water input, which then, of course, is eventually going to decline substantially um, to levels below what it was right. previously. So um, they, they are rapid changes. And I think that there are many places where the research is not keeping up with the speed of these changes. That's true for us understanding the glaciers and the ice sheets themselves, and also certainly true for understanding the ecosystems that depend on it. So I think it may be a case where we are changing things that we are not even able to keep up with or see the um, true level of those thank, changes. Thank you. I appreciate that very much. And a um, good place for the Science Committee to, to get some more research funded. Dr. Fiefer, some of your colleagues at the University of Colorado Boulder published a study in 2017 about the effects of dissolved black carbon on glacial melting. The sooty black material that's emitted from gas and diesel engines, coal-fired power plants, and wildfires is a significant portion of particulate matter and contributes to climate change, as we know. The study found that the black carbon from the combustion of biomass and fossil fuels can 
enhance glacial melting and uh, as black carbon deposits on snow and ice surfaces, then the part, uh, particles decrease the Earth's ability to reflect rays from the sun. So then there, that results in the absorption, absorption of heat and faster melting. But it's also worth noting from the testimony here today that even if anthropogenic emissions were halted immediately, we'd still see the reciprocal effects on glaciers. So um, Dr. Fiefer, um, what are the most apparent gaps in the current modeling of, of glacier recession for various emission scenarios? And assuming that the U.S. achieved a net zero carbon emission uh, policy by mid-century, where should we invest more federal resources in responding to the consequences of glacier melting? The, 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 the process that you bring up, this black carbon, is a, it, it's hard to see when you're actually out there. It's a, quite a subtle effect, but this very small particulate, which is particulate matter, which is carried into the air. And this was particularly a problem prior to the collapse of the Soviet Union, because there was a lot of coal burning industry in Siberia, far enough north for their emissions to get trapped in this atmospheric gyre in the Arctic. That's reduced a little bit, but not uh, by a, a large degree, and emissions from further south still get into the Arctic Basin. And also elsewhere, not all of Greenland is in the Arctic Basin, for example. Southern Greenland is exposed to um, air masses that come off of Europe and North America. So there's a lot of mixing, and this material continues to be deposited. Um, I think that the uh, understanding the surface energy balance Things like if you make the surface of an ice sheet just a tiny bit darker, how much um, effect will that have? That understanding is pretty well in hand, but we need observations. And simply knowing that it happens isn't, isn't enough. I really do think, though, that the basic uh, needs go um, beyond that to simply making the observations. Uh, there are so many parts of the world that were, in, until recently, really in, in the dark. A lot of uh, high mountain Asia, mm -hmm. so the Himalayas and other, other ranges, that's been partially addressed by remote sensing, but again, not all of it. Some of this work just has to be done on the ground. Thank you. And I see I'm out of time, but Chairwoman Johnson, I request unanimous consent to enter into the record this study from the University of Colorado. Without objection. I yield back. Thank you.